Message in a Bottle by Susan Dickinson Art by Laura Bifano For hundreds of years, scores of Boston-bound ships have foundered on the rocky ledges that lurk just beneath the waves all along the coast of Massachusetts Bay. The wreck of the brig St. John must surely be the most tragic of all. She was a famine ship out of Galway, packed full of hopeful youths and desperate families escaping the dire poverty rampant throughout Ireland during the Great Potato Famine of the 1840s. On October 7, 1849, after an uneventful month-long crossing of the North Atlantic, the St. John was hit by a grim nor'easter. She had just reached the entrance to Massachusetts Bay, so close to Boston that the night before, Captain Oliver invited the passengers to light up the deck and share libations to celebrate the beginning of their new lives in America. It was indeed the end of their journey, but for most of them, the only new beginnings would be in the afterlife. When dawn broke that morning, the crew of the St. John knew she was in trouble. Wind and waves prevented her from making any headway into the nearest sheltered harbor to sit out the storm. Instead, she was driven up near Minnow's Ledge, where the captain decided to drop anchor and wait, rather than chance sailing onto the rocky outcrop. But the anchors didn't hold, and the sails were shredding in the powerful winds. Helpless, the ship was soon tossed by the angry seas onto the rocks. In desperation, the crew cut down the masts and pitched them overboard, hoping to lighten the ship and thereby float it off the rocks. But to no avail, Monstrous waves relentlessly smashed down upon the little ship, breaking her back upon the rocks. Ice-cold water gushed into her crowded steerage, drowning many passengers immediately. Others managed to climb up onto the deck, only to be washed overboard into the killer surf. Early risers in the seaside town of Cohasset that Sunday morning could plainly see the stricken ship, but they were helpless to assist. Any rescue attempt would surely end in death for those brave enough to man the lifeboats. Many on shore later reported hearing the unforgettable screams of terrified passengers above the hurricane roar of the wind. They said it took only 50 minutes for the sea to smash the ship to pieces. For the next several days, pulverized wreckage floated into Cohasset's beaches and coves, along with the macerated bodies of dozens of passengers. These bodies, men, women, children, and babes, many with no identification, were solemnly collected by the townsfolk and buried in a long trench in or near the town's central cemetery. Slightly less than half of the approximately 99 victims of the wreck, the exact numbers have never been confirmed, are thought to be buried in Cohasset. Though nowadays, even the site is uncertain. The rest of those presumed dead were never found. There were very few survivors. Sixty odd years after the wreck, the ancient order of Hibernians, an Irish Catholic Brotherhood, erected a memorial, a 20 foot Celtic cross, on the highest point of the cemetery, a peaceful knoll from which you can see the beautiful yet treacherous sea that claimed so many poor souls that day. In 1849, Christopher Dooley was 15 and the only living son of Claire and Patrick Dooley. The family lived in a tiny cottage in the middle of nowhere, halfway between the hamlet of Frankford and the Sleeve Bloom Mountains in Kings County, Ireland. The nearest town of any size was Tullamore, but the only reason to go there was to drink, which Patrick often did. When he wasn't drinking, Patrick was cutting turf in the peat bogs that lie all around those parts, or arguing with Claire about money, or more accurately, the lack thereof. What little he made in the bogs, he spent in the pubs. Claire and their two children, with another on the way, lived miserably. Christopher loved his ma, but not his da. He couldn't stand seeing his father mistreat his mother, and he was sick of the insults and kicks his father bestowed so freely upon him. He figured 15 was old enough to do something about it. He wasn't about to challenge his brutal father, but he was going to beat him just the same. He knew he could earn money for his ma, real money too, not just the pennies his father sweated over in that wretched bog. Christy, as his mother called him, had secretly decided to go to America, where fortunes could be had for the taking. 
He knew this on good authority from an itinerant tinker he'd met at Frankfurt. Christie firmly believed that his crooked spine, an impediment to any work except begging in Ireland, would not hold him back in America. He was a clever boy, and despite no formal schooling, he learned to read and write so effortlessly that his mother dared to hope for him. But his da could only see that his son was a cripple. Over the years, the impoverished Irishman and his anguished wife had buried one sickly infant after another, leaving only Christy and his little sister still alive. But he had nothing to offer his son except bile. The curve in Christy's back first became noticeable when he was 12. His mother saw it, and it broke her heart, for she knew there was nothing that could be done. So unbeknownst to Patrick, Claire took an extra washing from the neighbors and scrimped and saved her meager earnings until she had enough to buy a St. Christopher medal for her boy. She even had it engraved around the edge with his name. When Christopher took the sacrament of confirmation in the little church at nearby Ballyboy, Claire gave him the silver medal. St. Christopher was Christie's namesake, and his mother prayed daily to the saint to protect her sweet son. St. Christopher was also the patron saint of travelers. It was as if Claire knew that someday her Christie would leave home. Silently, she hoped he might, for there was no future in Kings County for any men except those with strong backs, capable of hard labor in the bogs. Christy never told his ma any of his plans. He feared it would just worry her. Instead, he charted his route secretly, at night, up in the loft where he slept. He figured he could hitch a ride on a farmer's wagon as far as Tullamore, and then join up with any west-going barge on the Grand Canal. Riding the barges, he'd eventually make his way to Limerick and the sea. True, he was penniless, but he hoped to earn his passage by doing whatever menial jobs the barge pilots might need. He wasn't sure how he'd get from Limerick up to Galway, where the famine ships departed, but he was confident he could figure it out once underway. And in Galway, he'd somehow sneak aboard a ship bound across the ocean. Even if it took him years, he'd get to America, and one day, he'd come back a rich man to look after his ma. Blackie McClure was a great looming fellow with jet black hair and beard, a fine example of what the blonde folk of the peatlands might call black Irish. Blackie wasn't much older than Christy, but unlike the country lad, he'd grown up on the rough docks of Galway. His entire family had died in a wave of fever that hit the town when Blackie was only nine. He'd survived disease, privation, and dockyard toughs for 13 years, during which time he somehow grew to be a good-natured mountain of a man. He had little in common with the surprisingly bold and clever wee hunchback, as he called Christy, except a gnawing hunger to go to America. The unlikely duo became fast friends shortly after Christy arrived on the dock, sitting high and muddy on the back of a lumbering beer wagon. For several years, Blackie had saved his money until he finally had enough to book a one-way passage on a ship to America. His mates had told him of a brig leaving for Boston in early September, and Blackie was determined to be on it. When he heard of Christie's desire to stow away on any ship that was heading to the new land, he encouraged the country boy to try for the St. John. If you can get aboard, lad, we'll be mates, Blackie said. You can stick with me while we're at sea and we can stick together in America too, you and me. I can look out for you, wee hunchback that you are, and you can teach me all about readin' and writin'. Christy agreed that this was a perfect arrangement. After several days of studying the comings and goings of people and ships at the Galway docks, his plan took shape. On the day of the St. John's departure, he loitered among the crowd of passengers assembled on the dock, jostling for position to step onto the gangplank. In the chaos and confusion occasioned by the boarding of one particularly large family with nine excited children, he made his move. He slipped in among the swarm of children as they noisily pushed their way onto the ship. It was almost too easy. He knew that if he just hung around on the main deck, he'd eventually spot the towering Blackie, who'd take him under his wing. And that is exactly what happened. Over the next month, Blackie protected the stowaway from bullies and snoops, and Christie, repeating what he'd read in the Galway newspapers, kept Blackie enthralled with incredible stories of gold, just waiting to be had in California. The gruff young docker shared his food with Christie, who in return showed him the alphabet 
and how to put the letters together to make words. Blackie gave Christy a small corner of his bunk in the tween deck, which was crowded with nearly a hundred people of all ages. Having grown up in a one-room country cottage, Christy could sleep like a baby just about anywhere. While the ship pitched and rolled, he dreamed sweet dreams of Ireland, where he walked tall and straight over the green hills at Clonmacnaw Monastery, or along the lovely banks of the Silver River closer to home. Blackie, on the other hand, couldn't forget Ireland fast enough. He'd shake his head and proclaim, St. Patrick or no, that island is full of snakes and vipers. On more than one occasion, he swore to Christy, I'll never go back to that bloody island. Yet when Christy explained his plan to earn enough money to rescue his ma and little sister, Blackie's dark eyes would tear up. I don't remember my ma, hardly at all. You're a lucky lad you are. And he'd wipe his eyes with his sledgehammer hand. Don't go all mushy on me, Blackie, Christy would tease him. Snapping to, Blackie would grumble. Not on your life, you crooked little Fenian. By the time they arrived at the coast of Massachusetts that fateful October morning, their friendship was solid. Wake up! Wake up! The ship's in danger! Blackie shook him roughly. Christy's eyes snapped open, and he sat up in alarm, sensing their peril at once. In the dim light, he saw people all around him scrambling from their bunks. In an instant, their hushed chatter intensified to fearful shouting as they dashed to gather up their meager belongings. What can we do? Stick with me, lad, was all Blackie said. He stood at the foot of the bunk, both hands gripping the bunk post for balance as the ship rocked wildly. Just then, with a terrible thud and shudder, the St. John heaved hard to port. Many standing in the narrow gangway were thrown to the floor. Are we sinking? Christy yelled up to Blackie. It was impossible to believe. They were so close to America. Dunno. We gotta go up and find out, Blackie shouted above the din. Come on, lad. Wait, Christy pleaded. I've got to let my ma know. What? We got no time for letter writing, Christy. Blackie grabbed Christy's arm and started to pull him off the bunk. No, Christy shouted in sudden command. Give me that whiskey bottle you drank last night, and the stopper, too. Blackie released his grip on Christy and lifted the blanket, pulling out the nearly empty bottle. I was saving a swig for when we arrived, he complained. Well, don't save it. Drink it now. Blackie needed no more encouragement, and with one swallow, he downed the contents. He handed the bottle to Christy, who ripped the St. Christopher medal and chain from his neck and dropped it in. What good is that? Blackie bellowed. Without waiting for an answer, he glanced around and growled. Come on, lad, time's a waste in here. But he stood firmly planted despite the pushes and shoves of the agitated horde pressing past him. Not knowin' is worse than knowin', Christy shouted. Never hearing a word about me will surely break my ma's heart. If we're to die here, maybe someone ashore will find the bottle and let her know what happened. He rummaged in his roll and pulled out a wrinkled sheet of paper he had saved. It was a flyer advertising the St. John's voyage. He rolled it up and shoved it into the bottle on top of his medal. Blackie, watching him tarry so, rolled his eyes in exasperation. Christy jammed the stopper down and gripped the bottle tightly as, without another word, Blackie folded one massive arm around him, scooped him off the bunk, and forced his way through the pressing throng up the deck ladder. Just as they reached the steeply tilting deck, freezing water blasted through the floor and walls behind them, snuffing out the screams of the unlucky ones still below. Up on the wind-whipped deck, panicked passengers slipped and stumbled about, frantically shouting for missing children or searching desperately for a lifeboat, a barrel, a plank, anything to cling to as the doomed ship ripped and cracked apart. Blackie sprinted to the gunwale, with Christy still securely in his vice-like grip. In the blink of an eye, they were knocked overboard, along with dozens of others, by a monstrous wave that crashed down upon the deck. That is the story of Christy and Blackie, and the shipwreck as related to me, Maggie Dooley, by my great-grandmother when she was nearly as old as I am now. I remember her saying that nearly two years after the wreck, in the summer of 1851, she was one of two little girls, sisters, playing on Sandy Beach on a hot and humid afternoon. The sun beat down, and the sky was a deep heavenly blue. The air was heavy and still, and only the cries of seagulls pierced the quiet. On such an afternoon, it was easy to forget the malevolent violence of an October nor'easter. Indeed, 
the wreck of the St. John was the last thing on anyone's mind in Cohasset that day. The girls were digging holes in the warm white sand up near the dunes, searching for buried treasure. Their spades hit a curious hard object, which they proceeded to uncover and lift from the hole. It was just an old whiskey bottle, but through the hazy glass, they could see something inside, a paper cylinder and a metal object that clinked when they shook the bottle. They removed the stopper, pulled out the contents, and puzzled over the old flyer and the silver St. Christopher medal inscribed along the edge with C. Dooley. Disappointed at not finding gold doubloons, they nevertheless brought their paltry treasure home to show their parents, who understood its potential significance at once. The parents showed the intriguing find to town officials, who eventually managed to check the name against the list of passengers and crew of the St. John. There was no C. Dooley among them. Unfortunately, this omission did not negate the possibility that C. Dooley had been on the St. John, for there were rumors that the ship's official register was not complete. But even if C. Dooley had been a passenger on that doomed ship, it was impossible to say whether he or she might now be among the dead or still among the living. In all the confusion of that awful day, anyone could have struggled ashore anywhere along the coast. So by all accounts, the identity and whereabouts of the mysterious C. Dooley were questions that would very likely never be answered. Furthermore, there was no point in trying to locate family back in Ireland, for that country was in a state of complete disarray from the famine, not to mention that Dooleys were a dime a dozen. Since the unusual message in a bottle could never be delivered or even deciphered, one of the little girls was permitted to keep the flyer and the other, my great-grandmother, the medal. And you may judge what happened subsequently to be a pure coincidence, but I am not so sure. Ten years after she found the medal, when she was 21, my great-grandmother married a wealthy Irishman named Christopher Dooley from San Francisco. He and his business partner, another Irishman, whose name I don't recall, were among the last lucky fellows to strike it rich in the California gold rush. It seems that in October of 1861, this Christopher Dooley was returning to America from a visit to Ireland when he stopped at the port of Boston. With a few days to spare before he continued to San Francisco, he'd taken the stagecoach down to Cohasset. It was the anniversary of the St. John disaster, but on this October 7th, the day was sunny and calm. The slender and slightly stooped young man had been strolling along in Central Cemetery. As he was leaving through the gate at Joy Place, he encountered my great-grandmother, a noted beauty of her day. She was just arriving with her sister and a small contingent of villagers to pay their respects to the unknown but not forgotten victims. He tipped his hat and stood aside so she could pass through the narrow gate first. Just as she did so, he spotted the distinctive silver medal she was wearing as a brooch, pinned to her dress with a little black ribbon. He couldn't suppress a cry of surprise and recognition. That was the start of a wonderful conversation, one that led to 40 years of marriage and to the next generation and the next. Christie's message in a bottle had been delivered after all, not to his mother in Ireland, but to his future wife in America.